Lord, everybody. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Amen. We're going to call our service to order. We're going to open up with the scripture. And then we'll go into our prayer. Amen. 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 And they bring him unto the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription, superscription of his accusation was written over the king of Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, and he was numbered with the transgressors. I have read to you Mark, the 15th chapter, verses 22 through 28. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made. God, we thank you for this Good Friday. We thank you, oh God, that had it not been for Good Friday, we wouldn't be here today. We thank you, oh God, for what you did at Calvary. God, we thank you and we bless your name. God, as we move forward in this service, I ask that the Holy Spirit reign, rule, and abide in this place on today. Have your way in this house on tonight, oh God. Move like never before. Speak through each and every one of these preachers on tonight, God. Give them the revelation that you would have for us to receive on tonight, God. Lord, we came to celebrate what you have done, and we came to magnify and glorify your name. Have your way in this house on tonight, God. God, we ask that the Holy Spirit will show up in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you in advance. We thank you for the word that's going to come forth. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, God, we call on your name. Saying, God, glory, majesty, and honor be unto you. Speak, God. We will give you the glory. We'll go tell somebody about what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Whoa, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, 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 oh,
Amen. 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 Can you hear me? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Yeah. I will. I choose to. I command myself. I have made a decision to bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord with all of my heart. I will bless the Lord because I have the ability to. I have the activities of my limbs. I'm in my right mind and therefore I must praise the Lord because it's been mighty, mighty, mighty a long time. It's been a long time since we've gathered in the house of the Lord for some of us. We can let that sit right there. Now, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, I don't know what you came to do. I came to do. But I came to celebrate Christ. I came to celebrate Christ. Doing something that only he could do. You see, uh, it was Jesus himself that said, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And what I love the most about that scripture is begotten. And um, the, the, the original text of begotten, I'm not going to pronounce the word because I know you know it because you, we are all studiers in here. But it means uh, cut from the same cloth. It, it means to have the same essence of. You see, uh, Jesus was the only one who could rightfully say that he was the begotten son of God. So therefore, we are able to celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of what he has done and paying the price of sin that we could not pay. And we cannot take it lightly every single time we come together and worship God um, in the holy, sanctimonious place called church that we will be able to clap our hands and we don't have to do it in caves. And we are able to lift our voices and praise God and we don't have to whisper because it says with a loud voice, I will praise the Lord. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I am thankful unto him and I will bless his name. And what I love the most about this man named Jesus is that he didn't count it as robbery to empty himself out even to the point of death. That he says that I do this because while we were yet sinners, he died. While we were yet sinners, he decided to stretch his arms out on the old rugged cross and he decided to say seven last words, not the end of what he was saying, yeah. but it was just the words on the cross. Right. <laughs> it was just the words on the cross because we do know that he got up and he came yeah. back and well. he was teaching for another uh, few uh, 40 days, right? <laughs> and so we are ever so thankful for what Jesus has done. Yeah. And I don't take it lightly. You know, the last seven saints, I have to grow to love it. Because I'm like, it's a preaching competition, and I didn't understand it. I, I really didn't understand it. And it wasn't until I had a personal relationship, and I didn't live off of my mother's Jesus, and my grandmother's Jesus, and my sister's Jesus, that I was able to experience what Jesus did for me. So when he said, Father, forgive them, for they might not what they do, I was able to understand that I was a part of them. And he stayed there until he saw me. He 
He stayed there until he saw you. He stayed there until he saw uh, everybody behind him, in front of him, and past him. But at the end of the day, he said, oh, it is finished. The assignment was not done. It was just his earthly. It was just complete. You see, now I, I have to set the order of the house and make sure that we understand again that this is not a preaching competition, but we are sharing our, our shared experience with Jesus and our study and meditation. So clap and worship and remember what he's done for you as the associate ministers and the ministers of Jesus Christ come to share their gospel truth. Because it should be yours too. Amen. So uh, can you hand me my phone? I done left my phone right there. That's it. God bless your ministry. God bless your ministry. Amen. Oh, let us thank God for the music ministry of Sister Daria. Sister Pastor Adams. Recognize all of the pastors in the house, all of the ministers and clergy of the cloth, of the cross, of the cloth. <laughs> there it is. Uh, we, we acknowledge and, and honor your presence today, um, and we, we don't take your support for granted. Amen? Amen. We are going to start the service, um, the preaching ministry, with Minister Mimi Buckles. She's going to start us off with Father, forgive them. Then we are going to hear from Minister Carrie Ball. Yeah. Today you will be with me in paradise, followed by Minister Toya Woods. Behold thy mother. Yeah. Then we will hear from Reverend Tim Woods. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, ministers of the gospel, one person will preach, and I'm going to take the microphone, and then I'm going to clean that microphone. When that person is done, you will get a cleansed microphone. Praise you, Lord. All right, minister. Before I start, I would like to just start with the salutation that we do what I am accustomed to. This is the word of God. I believe that it is true. I believe it houses the power of transformation for my life. I commit my ears to hear his voice through his word. Let's go to work. Amen. Over 2,000 years ago, a Jewish carpenter had been arrested and apprehended on charges of blasphemy and treason. Yeah. The indictment of blasphemy was that he was both the son of God and God the son. The indictment of treason was that he claimed to be the king of Jews when they already had a king. He had gone through a mock trial, and though his judges found no fault in him, after a series of kangaroo court proceedings, being dragged from judgment hall to judgment hall, on Friday, April the 3rd, the year of A.D. 33, he was sentenced to Calvary's cross. They sentenced him to capital punishment of Roman crucifixion. He was mutilated and flogged. Wow. 
The Lord of glory was beaten, whipped, paraded up the street of Via Della Rosa, and they hung him on the cross, suspended by three nail spikes. They mocked him by placing a crown of thorns on his head. They sentenced him between two thieves. One cross on the right, where a thief would die in sin. Another cross on the left, where a thief would die to sin. And a center cross where a redeemer is dying for sin. Our Lord and Savior hung there for six hours from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. But before he took his last breath, he uttered seven comments. The first one being here in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. My brothers and sisters, even in his agony, experiencing horrible physical pain, barely able to breathe, he looks down at the Roman soldiers who were gambling for his clothes. He sees Jewish authorities relishing at the fact that they had done away with him. Onlookers are hurling curses at him but not really knowing why. Yet, my brothers and sisters, he still managed to pray a prayer for humanity. This is the first of three prayers of the seven last statements. Yeah, yeah. It is a prayer of unmatched mercy and love. When Jesus uttered this prayer, he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah 53 and 12, where it says he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The words, Father, forgive them, shows the merciful heart of God. But two things that we have to understand this evening about this verse. The first thing is how he gives reverence to the Father. Notice he says, Father, this gives ownership. Secondly, it's what he asks of his Father. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an easy thing to do. It is oftentimes difficult, but it's worth it. The word forgive means to let go or to drop, to erase the debt. Many of us can only acknowledge God and give him reverence when he is doing something that we want him to do. But how many of us will still reverence him as our father, even when we are in something that he has the power to prevent, but he chose not to? You may be in a situation in your life that has caused for forgiveness, but I'm here to let you know that the very first step is learning how to ask God to give you the strength to do what you cannot do on your own. Pastor Woods, notice that he doesn't ask God to pardon them. Because that would only benefit them for this particular sin. But when he says forgive them, he asks for forgiveness knowing that this is not only attached to their action, but it's also attached to their spirit. Yeah, yeah. What Jesus is saying here is forgive their person. Many of us forgive a person for what they have done, the action. But we don't forgive the person. This full phrase, it literally means to forgive one's true self. Jesus knows that he does not need to ask God to forgive their sin, but to forgive their true self. But can I be real with you this evening? You can smile in my face. You can give me all the accolades. But when I turn my back and you roll your eyes and make your little comments and even the thoughts in your head, that's the true you that Jesus is asking forgiveness for. Forgiveness is not that you didn't do what we both know you did. Forgiveness is me declaring that I'm going to hold back the consequence of what should have happened to you. Jesus gave us an example of how forgiveness is to work when we are in normal circumstances. He said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15, 
text say, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus is literally offering up a prayer of forgiveness to intentional offenders. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, they do. They just didn't know who they were doing it to. They knew that. They knew that. Because crucifixions back then, the word says, we walk by faith and not by sight. They knew what they were doing. Simply because they had no faith in who they were looking at. Oftentimes in life, not only do we know what we are doing we also just don't know who we are doing it to but yet my brothers and sisters Jesus is there asking for their forgiveness is this your same story will this be your same story there is somebody in here that has been holding a grudge for far too long and there's another that has not forgiven themselves well, I've come by Prospect Hill Baptist Church this yeah. evening yeah. to tell you that this is a clear snapshot of what forgiveness looks like. Yeah. These are people that want the life of Jesus. Uh -huh. They put nails in his hand. Yeah. They put nails in his feet. Yeah. But yet, here you are. You can't even forgive somebody that simply stepped on your foot and couldn't say I'm sorry. Yeah. Forgiveness is hard. It's hard when it's been plotted. It's hard when it's been pre-manipulated. It's hard when it's been premeditated. Especially when they know what it is that they are doing. But the truest meaning of forgiveness is when people are trying to do you harm, but you can still ask God to give them another chance. I'm out of here now. And I just want to let you know that I should never wait for an apology. We never read anywhere in the Bible where they said, I'm sorry, but yet when he gets to the cross, the first thing he does is ask for forgiveness. He is proving to us that real forgiveness does not wait for an apology. Again, for those of you that are struggling with forgiving people, remember God has forgiven you. And you have
somebody. Somebody say yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Ain't God all right. So y'all done set me up. But just like I tell people at my job, I'm not the mailman, but I'm about to deliver. trailblazers that made it possible for me to stand behind this sacred desk. That would be James C. Davis, Sr., Floyd Moore, Sr., and Mother Sally Adams. So if I didn't call your name, it's probably because you're still breathing. I extend honors to the shepherd of this house. And Darian Jones and when I think about them, I get a little teary-eyed, but I'm, I'm going to stay focused. I extend special honors to my mentor, <clears throat> my bishop, my bishop, the good, the great, Dr. L.D. Taylor. And in extending special honors, I extend honors to my pastor, my friend, my brother, L. James Taylor. And to all my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I must say the best for last. And my beautiful wife, Pamela Adams, thank you for being patient. And thank you for being patient. But I do have a word. My brothers and my sisters, I tag this sermonic presentation by just one simple word. And that is paradise. My brothers and my sisters on the plane of things made manifest. We the peculiar people have done a lot of things in our lives. We have done a lot of stuff in our lives. But have the things and stuff we have partaken in. <clears throat> Is some of the stuff and the things that we have done, is it still our burden? Or is it still our cross today? All right. Some of the people stuff and the things that they have done, some will take them six feet deep with them. And we would never know. But my brothers and my sisters, if I was to drop this cup, on the floor. Some would say, Rail dropped the mic. Others may say, He tossed the mic. But then there are those who may say, He let the mic go. We have the same event, different perspective, different viewpoints and interpretations. Are you still praying with me? Yeah. This is how it is in the synoptic gospels. But my brothers and sisters, I'm a little bit disturbed by the writings of Matthew because in his authorship of the last sayings on the cross, the problem that I have is that the cadence, the voice, and what Jesus hurled out to the thief, it was not recorded in his gospel. Well, how do you know? I didn't see no red. Because when you see the red, who's talking? Thank you. But yet, watch what he does. 
he displays the mockery, the disrespect of the Savior because he did spend a lot of focus on the chief priests, scribes, and elders of our Savior. That was recorded. So my brothers and my sisters, my ethos was disturbed. Allow me to draw a portrait of the canon, the, the canonical gospel according to Luke, the physician. Right. But see, my brothers and my sisters, the names were not mentioned in Matthew. They simply called them thieves. In Luke's gospel, they were male factors. Right. And that just simply mean that they were criminals. So my brothers and my sisters, I will simply call it like I read it. I'm going to keep it official like a reference. If you don't mind. See, that what it was, the three crosses, it had one that I already stated in verse 38 that this is the king of the Jews. So we know that the man in the middle was on assignment. But neither one of them Gospels had the names or given the names of the one on the left nor the one on the right. In my Bible, I didn't see it. So what I did, I did not fact check it because I didn't want to know their names. Because I wanted, if you don't mind, I wanted to give them an imaginary image of the names that I would have called them. So I would have called one of them an idiot. I would have called the other one an icon. So Webster's dictionary, I brought Webster to this stand and Webster defines Jesus Christ as an icon. But then you know how that word can mean more than one thing. So it kept going. It said, one that is worthy of veneration. And that simply means great respect, reverence. See, we always have the BET, the Essence, and the NAACP, and all those Essence, they have what they call the icon. So I want you to be the judge. My brothers and my sisters, on the cross, one doubted, mocked, and tempted Christ. Oh, Even facing death, his ignorance, his arrogance, and his vanity was demonstrated. Yeah. If you don't believe me, let's go to Luke 39. Come on. And it reads as such. And one of the male factors, which hang real on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But then, the other one rejected the idiot and humbled himself and made what I tend to call an iconic salvational request. Are you still praying with me? Let's go to Luke 4. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Man, don't you know who thou is? Doest thou fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation. You do the math. Which one do you think was iconic? And which one was an idiot? But my brothers and my sisters, it doesn't stop there. Because in my mind, I was like, well, let's just go back and see. Matthew got something to say about this. But he didn't. He steadily told in 40, 27, 40, 41, one said, man, you destroyed that temple. And you put it back together. <laughs> Save us. So I was a little bit upset about that. Because you didn't put nothing in red? What was the timeline? Did time change? 
before the icon realized and said, my God, he just may be the king of the Jews. So watch what he does. He says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. But he said unto Jesus, and this is what I simply call, I believe that it was a request for humanity. It wasn't just for him. Because idiots and people who are demonstrating vain, they care about nobody but themselves. But listen, here's what he said. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. How many of us would understand that I believe it was an iconic humanitarian move for anyone who is on their cross of iniquity, misfortune, anyone who's on their uh, cross of shortcomings and sins. You on the cross. You're going to be an idiot or an icon. But that didn't touch me. Here's what touched me the most. And he said unto the Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Anytime you see the word today in the Bible, it means that that is it. This is the day. So my brothers and my sisters, as I benedict this sermonic presentation, I thank you for being patient. And I thank you for being oh, 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 so kind. But when I ask you what kind of things you have done, and all of us to bring in some stuff. Tell you every day I ride down I 70. And it said, Do you want to live the legacy in Graceland? Ain't God alright? I said to myself, I don't want to live in Graceland with Elvis and Lisa Marie. Ain't God alright? I don't want to go to California and live with Bubbles and Michael Jackson. Ain't God alright? I definitely don't want to go to Never Never Land and live with Tinker Bell and Peter Pan. Ain't God alright? You probably saying, Mr. Preacher Man, what are you talking about? I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. to third heaven. Ain't God alright? I want to go with the one who said I prepared a place. Ain't God alright? I want to go to paradise with Jesus Christ. Where did you want to go? Somebody say yeah! Yeah! Oh, 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 oh. Ain't God alright?
everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Can we bring a word of prayer? Father, I want to thank you for your goodness. I want to thank you for your grace today. I thank you for being with us. We're asking you now, Father God, that you would just hear our heart and anoint us, God, and that we would hear what you're saying to us today. We glorify you, we bless you, God, and we give your name praise. Glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I do honor God for being here today to my brother who is the pastor of this place, Pastor Darian, to my husband and my bishop, my pastor, Bishop uh, Timothy Woods, to everybody here in the respective places, every pastor, every lay member, every minister, we honor God today. If you will, will you turn to the book of John, 19th chapter, 26th verse. When you have it, you can say amen. If you know you're not going to turn her anyway, you can say amen to her. <laughs> I'll be saying to see sometime. I'll be like, hey, amen. John 19 and 26 says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Yes. May the Lord have us to the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his word. Amen. Glory to God. As we know in this particular series of events that is going on here on the cross, and my sister set the tone so well, so I don't have to rehearse that again. But I want you to understand that even while there was agony going on at that cross and turmoil going on at the cross and so much activity happened on, happening on the cross, Jesus couldn't help but see his mom there. The mother who was with him from the beginning. The mother who, when, she, when God came to her and the angels came to her and told her that she was going to conceive him, received it, held it in her heart. She didn't tell everybody what the Holy Spirit said to her. She just held it in her heart. And how many know that sometimes when God gives us a word, we got to hold it in our heart? Sometimes we talk about the word and we mature it and now some what the Lord is going to do. We kind of mess up the thing that the Lord is going to do. Amen. But Mary heard the word and she held it in her heart. Glory to God. And she didn't feel like it was beneath her to be a teenager about to be doing this great task. She was obedient unto the word of the Lord. You got to understand something that Jesus and Mary grew up together. Can I just talk like Toya? Jesus and Mary grew up together. You know, she was a teenager when she had them. And I'm, I'm a grown older woman. I've had children. I still don't probably know what I'm doing with children. Anybody else in here understand what I'm saying? And here it was. Jesus was teaching Mary and Mary was teaching Jesus. And so they formed a relationship. They formed a relationship. Here in this particular word of scripture, we understand that there is a word of relationship that is happening here. And so you got to understand that when Jesus is going through everything he's going through, Mary is not just one of his followers or one of the people that he just happened to say she's going to follow him. She was with him from the very beginning. I'm talking about the same Mary. You got to understand why he called a woman. It's not even dis of disrespect. It's to bring her to herself. Because sometimes you somebody's mother and you in ministry, sometimes you kind of Get mom involved in, right? And so Jesus always talked to her and called her woman not to put her in her place, but that's so she can understand, like, look, we hear woman, we ain't die yet. We're gonna get that, but we're here. So when he calls her woman, it's from a loving place. Glory to God. I imagine on the cross as he was sitting there, he couldn't call her mama because any mothers in here, if you see your child going through, if they say ma, be equal to even the ma get out. But if the ma, you gonna go and see about your child's rescue. And so once again, he called. Yeah. I 
can't just leave her in his hands because you got to understand this. Glory to God, she humbled herself to me, yeah. even carrying me. And even when my ministry was going forth, she humbled herself even the more and went about in the ministry. Yeah. So when I close my eyes on this side and I open them up on glory on that side, I need to make sure Mary good. So Karen John, the disciple whom I love, I have some other disciples and they okay, but I know how we rock, how we roll.
behind my favorite preacher in the whole world. Only, only Barry and Jones could have did that. We honor pastor of this church. Amen. To each and every one of you all. Amen. I say uh, I'm honor my wife, but y'all just heard her. So, I appreciate it. Bibles, if you will, and turn to the Gospel according to Matthew. Y'all will forgive me. Uh, this is my round two. I won't be long. Turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter. Verse number 45, when you got to say amen. amen. Still looking for it, say, wait a minute. Verse number 45 says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Yeah, right. About the ninth hour, Jesus yeah. cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man called for Elias. Straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. This is the word of God. Last with us, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands for all of eternity. Uh, this is the word of abandonment, but if you would allow me to just uh, put somewhat of a tag on this text, uh, let me just speak from this subject, what to do in the dark. Uh, what to do in the dark. Many of us sitting in this room have had occasions in our life where we have done the very best we can. We have given our all in certain circumstances, and yet somehow we have felt a, a, a placement or a, a, a feeling of loneliness. Yeah, yeah, Accompany that loneliness with the fact that uh, there are times or circumstances where there is not enough illumination around us to understand why we feel it what we feel. I'm going to say that again because you might not want to be real enough with yourself tonight. And the truth of the matter is many of us can identify and pinpoint how we feel. But if asked why you feel, how you feel, that may not be an accurate or quick answer. Uh, you might have some issues with relationships in your adult life and when asked why, you don't know why. You might have issues with uh, uh, being around large crowds of people and yet you can't explain why the social anxiety. We, we know how we feel. We just don't know why we feel it. We are in a place of darkness. Uh, this particular text that I, 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 I was assigned on this evening gave me a lot of questions and a lot of answers. Uh, the fact is that Jesus has now been hung on the cross for now three hours. For three hours he has been hanging in agony. For three hours he has been uh, pierced with nails in his hands and a spike in his feet. For three hours, he didn't have a crown of thorns wrapped around his head. For three hours, he's had soldiers walking around mocking him and saying all manner of cruel things to him in front of his mother and some of his followers. For three hours now, he has been drenched with his own sweat and blood. So to the point of dehydration, before even getting to the cross, he was whipped all 
night long. Uh, before even getting to the cross, uh, he was led from judgment hall to judgment hall. Now suffering from sleep deprivation, along with all of the trauma that is happening to his body. Beyond all of that, having to deal with the human element of the crucifixion, now nature seems to have lost its mind. It ain't bad enough that people have done what they doing, but now nature is out of whack, because now it being the ninth hour, 12 noon, how in the world is it dark outside? Something is off when the brightest hour becomes the darkest hour. I wish there was somebody in here who can celebrate and be honest and say, when I thought I should have been at my happiest, when the brightness should have been going off, how in the world did darkness still show up? Well, make sure God was still in here. Y'all said, oh, you're making me nervous. They make me nervous when they stand up over on Arlington. It says, and around the ninth hour, darkness covers the earth. It does not say it got dark. It says darkness covered. It does not speak of darkness as a condition. It speaks of darkness as an entity. This ain't the first time this entity has been here because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness covered the face of... This ain't the first time it got dark. Can I talk to you real quick? I know you want to act brand new, but this ain't the first time you've been in the dark. This ain't the first time you've been broke. It ain't the first time you done needed healing. This ain't the first time you done been alone. Why are you acting brand new? Like this a new cut? This ain't your first go round. So text says, text says, and around the night hour, it got dark. And here's the thing. None of us was there the first time it got dark. But Jesus was. For in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. Everything was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. He was there the last time darkness showed up. And what he does, I just, I only had one point because I told y'all my second round, I only, had, I only got one thing I want to tell you. That in the midst of abandonment, what do you do in the dark? I'm glad you asked. The answer is right here. Jesus remembered what was done the last time darkness showed up. Because in verse number one of Genesis, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse number two says, and darkness covered the face of the deep. But verse number three gave us the answer. Verse number three said, and God said. So what do you do in the dark? You go to the word. The word is what you use in the dark. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Because there's something about what the word does to the dark. Because when the dark showed up and the word came out, the Bible tells us that the darkness ran not to be seen again. But then, I noticed that it wasn't just the word, but it was the manner in which the word was applied. Because the text says that he hollered out 
with a loud voice. Megas phone. That's the Greek of it. Megas phone. He 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 got loud in the dark. What do you do in the dark? I'm glad you asked. Yeah, you need the word. But the next clue to what to do in the dark is don't be quiet. Ah, ah, too many times we allow the darkness and we allow the circumstances to close our mouth. I come here to Prospect Hill on this evening just to remind you it was your sound that got you here. You confessed with your mouth and you believed in your heart. You know that you opened your mouth and said Jesus is Lord. Is there anybody in here who didn't have to use that name and you didn't do it quietly? I wonder is there anybody who can testify and say that when I used his word I didn't whisper it because the clue to how to survive the dark is open your mouth. That was my introduction, y'all saw. Let me hit this text before they say I can't preach. Text says, says that he opens his mouth with a loud voice and says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, many of us sitting in this room would say that Jesus is leveling an accusation against God. He's saying, God, you turned your back on me. We were supposed to be in this to win this. And yet somehow I feel like you have walked away and left me all alone. I disagree with that position. And I would disagree with any theologian that holds it. Because I believe that Jesus is doing exactly what he's supposed to do. He quotes the first verse of Psalm number 22. But that does not understand this. He is not only quoting the word of God, but he's singing a song. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, our perfect example shows us how, how to not only quote the word, but still quoting the word, praise God at the same time. Because if you read Psalm 22, it is a testament of the human condition. Sometimes we up and sometimes we down. Sometimes we got it and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're happy and sometimes we are sad. Sometimes we have victory over our enemies and sometimes they get the best of us. But what the song tells us is thou, O oh God, who inhabits the praises of your people. The song says that no matter what my condition is, God is consistent. It's not an accusation to God. It's a reminder to God that no matter what I go through or what is happening around me, the darkness may be here, but guess what? You still good. You still my daddy. You still my God. You still my keeper. You still my vindicator. Is there anybody in here who will testify to the fact no matter what I go through, he's still God. Now the thing about it is, after being in the dark, using the word, and not being quiet, something is going to happen to you that is going to seem strange. People are going to think you weird. They're not going to understand what you're doing or why you're doing it. It's in the text. They misunderstood Jesus even when he does and quotes this verse. They say he calling Eli. 
He calling, he calling Elijah. <laughs> let's wait and see if Elijah come. Don't bother. Let's, let's see if Elijah really come. They misunderstood thinking that Jesus was calling for the assistance of somebody else. I ain't calling nobody to come help me. I can deal with you myself. The Bible says he told them I could have brought 12 legions of angels. Could have happened you on my own. I ain't need no help. I need you to understand that at this point, I am still conversing with the God who sent me here. So what to do in the dark is quote the word. Don't be quiet and care less if you misunderstood. God bless you. Jesus, he said, when you call him, he comes. Thank you for Jesus. 
thank you. Because somebody needs Jesus and nobody else. So you can quit talking to your neighbor and just look up towards heaven and not say, thank you for what you've done, God. Thank you. Thank you. For the, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. I'm done. It's offering time. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's offering time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can't pay him for what he has done. We can give out of the abundance of our hearts. Glory to God. Thank you. <laughs> We're asking everyone for a $10 seed. A $10 seed. $10 seed. Um, we have Cash App now for the Gateway Ministers Alliance. Um, it is uh, dollar sign S T L G M A. If you're giving, please give electronically. If you're giving electronically, give by way of Cash App dollar sign S T L G M A. We are also accepting cash and chips. Some of you may be wondering, what is Gateway Ministers Alliance? There has been a need in the time of, of uh, uh, teaching and education, ministerial-wise. And uh, the Lord placed it upon Pastor Darian Jones's heart. Um, to start a an alliance of ministers so that we will be able to get the training that we need ministerial wise to be successful in ministry to level the playing field to understand that we are in this together so the seeds that you're sowing tonight are actually uh, is actually to further the mission of the Gateway Ministers Alliance amen Amen. It is open to both men and women of the gospel. That's right, man. Men and women of the gospel. We all need teaching and we all need training. And so we are learning from one another. We are learning and, and pushing one another just as we are doing tonight. And if you haven't realized, everybody on the lineup are um, uh, associate ministers or uh, uh, preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. And so we are pushing each other, we are encouraging each other to dive deeper in our studies and to not get comfortable with where we are, but allow the Lord to minister to us and allow us to learn different study tools and tactics. Amen? So if you are ready, you can stand up um, and you can just come and give. Just, just come and give. Just come and give. You all can come down the middle aisle. Just come and give. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, I, 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 
Amen. Okay, we're going to have, uh, following the ministry of song, we're going to have Minister William Murphy come, and he's going to present I Thirst, followed by Reverend Dana Jackson, with It Is Finished. And lastly, we're going to have Reverend Brian Weaver, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Amen.
to the angel of this house, Pastor Darian Jones. I thank God for you allowing me to come and to share my conviction about Christ. And to my pastor, Pastor Michael D. Wallace. Thank God for my pastor. Amen. Amen to this preaching clergy. Amen. Amen. It's all, the tone has already been set. Amen. So I'm going to just give it to the Lord has given me. And to all the pastors, amen, all the pastors that are here, amen, go with me uh, to John chapter 19. Go with me to John chapter 19, verse 28. John chapter 19, verse 28. When you have it, say amen. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished yeah. that the scripture might be fulfilled yeah. said I thirst yeah. now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine put it on a hassle and put it to his mouth this is the word of God for the people of God his word is true and can be trusted for the time that is mine, I would like to preach from this subject. It was all according to plan. It was all according to plan. From the beginning, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus was to have been in excellent physical condition. As a carpenter by trade, he participated in physical labor. In addition, he spent much of his ministry on foot traveling across the countryside. His stamina and strength most likely were very well developed. It is clear just how much he suffered. But if torture could break a man in such good shape, this must have to have been a heroic, a, a heroic, <laughs> uh, a, a, a tough experience. A tough experience. Now it leads him to Golgotha, the place of Scar, the Viva de la Rosa. He has been betrayed by his own disciples. He has been mocked and he has been denounced as the Messiah, abandoned by his disciples. He has been beaten beyond recognition. The metal balls on the strips of leather from the whip that hit his skin was digging into his muscles. The sheep bone tearing out chunks of his flesh, exposing the bone. The thorns, uh, the, the thorns from the crown that was pushed, that was put on his head, they were digging into his skin, causing damage to the nerve that sustained his face. Due to severe blood loss, Jesus' physical condition now has become critical. His lungs are collapsing. His heart is failing. He is suffering from dehydration, struggling to get sufficient oxygen to the tissues. The weight of the body, of his body, pushes down on the nails in his feet, causing severe nerve damage, severing the arteries in his foot. The weight of his body as he pushes down on the cross it is so heavy that he is struggling for every breath that he takes. Come on, but I want to talk about this. This is a twofold. Uh, this is a twofold in this narrative. Jesus experiences a physical thirst, but he also experiences a spiritual thirst. Because brothers and sisters, may I permit to tell you today that Jesus was a hundred percent man, but he was also a hundred percent divine. The humanistic side of Jesus is thirsty. He has been on the cross now for six hours. It is hot outside, causing Jesus to be exposed to immense heat. The sweat is rolling off, off him like buckets. His blood is mixing with his sweat as it pours off his body. At this point, dehydration has set in on Jesus. Oh my God. 
Dehydration, first it causes a fever. Then dehydration causes, it causes a throbbing pain in your head. And then dehydration causes cramps in your abdomen. And then as we talk about dehydration, then here comes nausea. Nausea sets in. And then your lips begin to become dry when you talk about dehydration. And then the tongue gets swollen and thick which causes the throat to feel like sandpaper. It's no wonder that Jesus was thirsty. But yet, may I paint the picture, but yet, maybe he is thirsty, he is, but yet he is thirsty, and they give Jesus a hospital plant, which is a spongy type of material of sour vinegar wine. It is one of the cheapest wines in those times. This is not no Stella Rose. This is not no St. James. This is not one of those type of wines. This is a sour type of wine, like some Merlot type of dry wine. This type of wine. Don't act all saints and like you don't know what wine is. You know what wine is. You know what wine is. cheapest wines in those times. And if you drink too much of it, it could be used as an astringent which could constrict the throat. But just a little bit could moisten the lips. Just a little bit could moisten the tongue. Just a little bit could moisten the throat. So Jesus would be able to say his last few words that he had to say. And when I tell you, when Jesus got something to say, it's nothing, no demon in hell that can stop the oh word that's going for. Yeah. Yeah. But can you think, can you sit here and think on how Jesus voluntarily subjected himself to extreme thirst? This is the same one who caused water to flow from a rock. This is the same one who turned water into wine. And if he is the same one, he's able, if he could uh, quench his thirst, he would with just one word. But he does not only do that, but he just receives a bit of wine. Jesus could have easily quenched his thirst. But yet he only receives a bit of sour wine. But the only reason why he now thirst is because he submitted himself to do so. Because it was foretold in scripture that he would do so and accomplish the Father's will to suffer and to thirst for not only me, but you out there. But here comes the divine spiritual side of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, look, but notice how Christ shows respect for the scripture and a desire to allow it to come to pass. The reason why he says, I thirst out of his mouth is because he knew that it was for the fulfillment of scripture. Because back in Psalm 69, verse 1 through 3, he says, the psalmist says, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I seek in deep mirror where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the flesh, where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail when I wait, while I wait for my God. The psalmist is basically describing his situation as himself sinking in dear water. In a, with the flood sweeping over him but it was with a parched throat the psalmist goes on to say he looked for pity for relief of his thirst but was only given sour wine to drink Jesus is currently fulfilling this scripture as he drowns in the deep waters of God's wrath against our sins that are upon him and as Jesus bears our sins he bears them alone. And I also want to say that, yes, he was trying to fulfill scripture, but have you ever thought about that? Maybe Jesus is thirsting after being back in fellowship with God because he is yet on this cross and he has to bear these sins alone. But have you ever thought that maybe he's trying to get back in fellowship with God? How do you know that he's been away from him and God had to turn his back on him? Because our sins was upon Jesus, so God could not associate himself with the sins that was on Jesus, so God had to turn his back. On oh, his son, all oh, for me, you, and I. Yeah. Yeah. Get a thirst yeah. to be reconciled back with his father. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is God the Father and God the Son who have always existed in eternal relationship. Yeah. 
They have never been set, uh, uh, they have never been separated by anything for any length of time or in any type of way. They had never been separated. They had ne nothing had ever come between God the Father and God the Son. No will, no desires, no intentions, no thoughts, no purpose. Nothing can separate Jesus from his Father. But God the Father and God the Son. And along with the Holy Spirit, always lived in perfect relationship and in perfect unity. But yet when Jesus went to the cross, he took on the sins of all people throughout the time upon himself. And he bore our sins in his own body. The one who knew no sin. He became a curse just for us. So as God the Father and God the Son had to separate, now Jesus is thirsting for time back with his father. Some of y'all would have lasted five minutes giving your baby away to, 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 to endure such severe punishment. You can imagine being able to give your only, only child away or any of your children away to suffer these things by themselves. Because that's what real parents do. Real parents take care of their children. But God was right there. But God had to turn his back. But Jesus is thirsty to be on the right hand of the Father. He's thirsting to be back into communion with him. He's thirsting to be back with his protector. Yeah, yeah. But when you have a fight, when you have a thirst to please and glorify God, you won't mind suffering a little while or suffering sometimes in life when you have a desire and a passion to please God. Because yeah. in, Luke, in Luke 18, 31, he told his disciples that everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Yeah. And Jesus is only saying that everything that's happening right now is all according to plan. Yeah. I just want to tell you that it was not strange that, that, that Jesus was thirsty. Jesus always had a, a, a thirst to save souls of humanity. Well, Murphy, you ask, how, Murphy, how does he, how does he save, how does he always have a desire and a thirst to, for, to save souls of humanity? When Jesus told God, well, pray me about it, yeah. I'll go down and I'll redeem man. Jesus thirsty. And as we look back on his three and a half years, Jesus constantly thirsty. Jesus had a thirst when he opened up blinded eyes, when he unstopped deaf ears, when he raised Lazarus from the dead. When he healed the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus had a thirst. And but how, you may ask me, how do I thirst after God? But the way you thirst after God is when you put your hands in his hands. When you worry about the Father's business instead of your business, God knows how to take care of you. And I strip my trust in him. And I lean not to my own understanding. But in all my ways, I acknowledge him. And he shall direct my paths. And just as Jesus had to go through some things, surely you're going to have to go through some things. God told us to expect trouble. And just like Jesus had to go through it, this will be many a days. You're going to tell God this wasn't a part of the plan. You're going to have many sleepless nights. You're going to have a rough journey. But I do know the Lord. He will make a way. That late in the midnight hour, he'll be a bedside company keeper. He'll be a mind regulator. Jesus. The servant is suffering. The servant, the suffering servant. Jesus, my elder brother. Jesus, my will in the middle of the will. Jesus, my right Lord the star. Jesus, my way in. Jesus, my way out. Do you know? Have you tried?
morning. Amen. Surely it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's been a day, a day of preaching. A day of proclamation. A day of celebration. Mm -hmm. Come on, Red, preach! Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. I give honor to God, the reverence to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, thank God for my pastor, Pastor Darian Jones, the visionary. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and get into the word. Yeah. In John chapter 19, yeah. verse 30. Yeah. <laughs> so when Jesus had received the sour wine, oh. he said, it is finished. Yeah. All right. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This is the word of God. I believe that it is true. The grass withers the flowers. But the word of our God shall stand forever. When a servant has a mission or an assignment given by their master, once complete, they come back and say the word. Mm -hmm. To tell us time. Yeah. Yeah. To tell us time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mission complete. All right. When an artist creates a masterpiece, he steps back, pleased with his work. He says, to tell us, to tell us time. Mm -hmm. get that at some point. Perfection. When a debt has been recorded, yeah. And it's written on parchment. Oh. And once the debt has been paid, uh -huh. the ink pad is open. And the appropriate amount of pressure is applied to the step yes, yeah. to convey one message. To yes. Telesta. Yeah. Paid in full. Yeah. The debt has been cleared. Yeah. And the debtor is free from the burden of debt. Yeah. Is wiped clean. Yeah. To less die, yeah. paid in full. God uses this word, this accounting word uh, on the cross. In three words in English, he simply says, It is finished. And what is the it? Uh, I'm not going to be before us long. I'm not going to be before us long. It is uh, the work of redemption, the Mosaic covenant with the, the priesthood and the, the temple and the sacrifices. It is the curse of the law, the fallen state of creation, uh, Satan's power and his hold on man, the penalty of, of death, of, of sin. See, Jesus, he who knew no sin.
and the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and the symbols and the foreshadowing of this anointed one. It is in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. We have over 300 uh, prophecies. It is there that we see that he is the seed that would crush the serpent's head. It is there that we hear that he is going to be the one that comes from the line of Jacob. It is in the Old Testament that we hear that he would be born in Bethlehem. It is in the Old Testament that we see that he would be our kinsman, redeemer. It is there in the Old Testament that we see that he will be the captain of our salvation. It is there in the Old Testament that we see that we will have a good shepherd. It was there in the Old Testament that we see that he will be the Prince of Peace. It is there in the Old Testament that we will see that he is going to be our sure foundation. There in the Old Testament, it tells us that we have one that is coming that will be the messenger of the new covenant there. In the Old Testament, the prophet tells us that we have one that is coming that will be despised and rejected. We have one that is coming that will be the perfect sacrifice. Every prophecy, every foreshadow, every symbol of life, of the, the life and the ministry of and the death of Jesus Christ, it was the fulfillment and it was finished right there. On the cross, Jesus the high priest, Jesus the lamb. And year after year, year after year, the high priest would go into the temple and, 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 and would make sacrifices for the sins of the people. Year after year, sacrifices were made and it was done on a continual basis. And finally, the high priest that didn't need to go through sacri uh, cer ceremonial cleansing to perform his priestly duties because he is the high, the highest of the highest he is the most precious lamb, the ultimate and the most holy sacrifice. It is finished. It is. It is. It 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 is. It, it, it is. The is 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 the present tense of the third person, singular of the word. We. It is God uh, in his omniscience, God in his omnipresence. Uh, he speaks uh, uh, in the present tense that spans from eternity past into to present day while on the cross. And it reaches and, and it echoes through generations. And here we are standing in 2024. We had a sin debt that we could not pay. And it is through one man sin entered into the world. And it is through one man that, that sin is paid off because a holy God could not accept an unholy sacrifice. A holy God could not accept something that was not perfect. A perfect God cannot accept anything blemished. And it was Jesus that took our sins. It was Jesus. Yeah, God put, I mean, all of our sins were put on Jesus. I know, I'm no stranger to myself, so I know my sins and I, I know how heavy that can be. Uh, but can you imagine that all of our sins were, were put on Jesus, uh, the Lord, he laid uh, on him the iniquity of all of us. He bore the sins of many. Uh, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He became the curse for us all. He was offered once to bear the sin of the many. He bore in his body the sin and he was hung on a tree. We know that we can make this one declaration because it's there in the book that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And we have this gift because we believe. We believe that he was wounded for our transgressions. We, we believe that he was bruised for our iniquities. We believe that the chastisement of our peace was upon his 
showed us. We believe that by his stripes we are healed. So when you ask why did he say it is finished? He, he didn't say it because uh, he was tired. He, he did not say it because he was exhausted. He, he didn't say it because he was ready for the suffering to end. He didn't say it because he wanted to get off the cross. He didn't say it because he was ready to get up somewhere and go to sleep. He didn't say it because he was tired of people mocking him. He didn't say it because he was ashamed. He didn't say it, but he said it because uh, he paid the price for our salvation. He, he said it because our liberation has been made. He said it because we are healed. He said it because our restoration has been made complete. He said it because we have been reconciled. He said it because we have been justified. He said it because we have been redeemed. And when he said In the indicative mood, he he said it, and, and, and when he said it, he said it. Uh, it was an action that took place in the past, and, and, and because it took place in the past, uh, and he said it, and it still yields results uh, to this current moment. He he said it, and in and, and, and this act, this act, the death on the cross that took place, that is an objective fact, and we can't deny that. Plenty of people saw that. They, Jesus, now he paid it all. Jesus, he paid it all. So when he died and he forgave us of our sin, he forgave the sin of the past and he forgave the sin of the future. He forgave the sin right now and he paid this price and all to him we owe. Sin has left a crimson stain and he has washed us white, whiter than snow. We are free. Praise the Lord. No longer back. No more chains holding us. Uh, our soul can rest. And it's just another blessing. Praise the Lord. Because we are free. No longer bound. We don't have to deal with the penalty of sin. But we are free. And we are free indeed. Because he said that it is finished. He said. Bible says thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light unto my path. Family, if I was able to tag this text, I would tag this text with this topic, the ultimate transfer. The ultimate transfer. Family, it's been hours now that Jesus has been hanging on this cross. Blood is flowing freely from his body and he is in excruciating pain. Darkness is covering the earth past the woods. The sun is fully eclipsed and the afternoon now has the appearance of midnight. And here is Jesus who is about to feel the frigidness of death and lay down his life being the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of all humanity. And he looks up towards heaven and says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He echoes these words from his forefather David in Psalm 31 and 5, proving once again that the spirit of Christ testified in the Old Testament prophets and that he came to fulfill scripture. Now he is to make his soul an offering for sin. By these words, he is offering up the sacrifice, making the ultimate transfer, moving the spirit from the earthly body into the hands of his father. One of the first observations I see, family, in this seventh word on the cross, I see confidence on this cross. And that through these words, Christ expresses his willingness to offer up himself. Yet into thy hands I commend my spirit. It comes from the Greek word tithemi, T-I-T-H-E-M-E, which means a deposit. Yeah, it means to place something. It means to set before. It means to, 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 to present something to somebody. This is a, to keep for me, is a term where somebody makes a decision to give something over. And not only is someone giving a decision to give something over, but they trust the one who they're giving to. This gives credence to the idea that the Romans did not kill Jesus. This gives credence to the idea that the Romans did not kill Jesus, but that Jesus made the conscious decision to lay down his life for the sins of in John 10 verse 18 when he said no man take my life I wish I had somebody to help me but I lay it down and if I have the power to lay it down then I will wait until Sunday for, for that one for that part of the, the peripheral but if I have the power to, to, to lay it down then, then surely I got the power to good God almighty to take it back up and here it is family Christ signifies his reliance on his father and commits his spirit into his father's hands to be received by his father. Yeah, while being in the will of God, he trusted his father in life and in death. All oh, family, we got to understand Jesus did not just start walking in God's will at Gethsemane. Lord have mercy. Jesus did not just start walking in God's will at Calvary's Hill. No, but in life and in death, he submitted to the will of his father. It's so real that in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was 12 years old, he told his mother, woman, don't you know that I must be a good God almighty? That I must be about my father's business. Jesus trusted his father in life and in death. Maybe teaching us a lesson. That the lesson is when you walk in the purpose that God has called for you to do, your job is to trust him from start to finish. Good God Almighty. That your trust it ought to be in the Lord and God wants us to trust him from start to finish. And here's the good news. You can submit to who you trust in. Lord have mercy. You can submit to the one who you have put your trust in. And the worst thing that we can do in this life, family, is to put our trust in what cannot be trusted. Lord have mercy. Can I let me put it to you another way? The worst thing you can do, family, is to put your faith in filth. Lord have mercy. So, the question now is, whose agenda are you submitting to? Are you submitting to your own agenda? Or are you submitting 
to the Lord's agenda because Christ trusted his father till the very end and he knew exactly which hands to put his life in and that's what Christ expects from each and every one of us because the Bible says it like this, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and is there anybody in here who can say in my faith walk I'm going to be just like Jesus I'm going to put my confidence in the father's hands from start to finish and here's the good news family, you can shout because in life and in death you can be confident that And to, and, and to rejoice with them. My, my, my first go-to was not to go to the coach and, and, and to rejoice with him. But I had to run back to the arms of my father. Two reasons why. Because the first reason is that he was the one who sent me out in the first place. And the second reason was simply because he's my father. And he and I share in the same love of baseball before I ever joined in a baseball team in the first place so I had to go back to the one who shared with me in the love of baseball before I ever joined a baseball team and that's exactly what the Lord did for us yeah he shared his blood for us and after everything was completed after everything was done he went back to the one who sent him 
in the first place. He went back to the one who shared with him before the foundations of the world. He made the transfer. And I've been waiting for this. And he died. Good God Almighty. He died. I've been waiting for this moment. He died unto the earth. Rock and rail like a drunken man. He died until the sun received a memo that two souls cannot shine at the same time. So the sun refused to shine. He died until the moon tripped down in blood. He died until the veil of the temple was torn in two. He died. How many know he died? He died until the centurion soldier said, surely this must be the Son of God. And he died in confidence. And he died so I come to encourage you, be like Jesus, walk in the wheel of the Father from the beginning all the way to the end. It reminds me of a song that says, hold to God's unchanging hand, because there's a last verse that says, and when your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, So shall you. And is there anybody here that can say, I'm glad that Jesus taught me how to walk in the will of the Father. That when my time is up and he receives my soul, he'll be pleased with what I've done. That when it's all over, when it's all said and done, when all the smoke has cleared, when all the dust has settled, received by the one who sent me. I gotta get out of here now, Pastor. But I got some good news. Before I leave, you can shout because Jesus may have died, but he won't be dead for too much longer. Y'all don't want to have no church. I said he may have He may have died, but you can shout tonight because he won't be dead for too much longer. Do you know him? Have you tried? Ain't he alright? I said, ain't the Lord alright? I gotta get out of here, Pastor. I'm glad you're here because you wanna tell your neighbor if I don't know nothing else.
said, when I pick, say a word. So, don't, don't let her do that by herself. Come on, that's not bad. She been holding that in all worship. She been holding that in all worship. Let's help my sister pray. She been back there. I don't know what she's going home to. But let's get shot with her back.
Amen. Amen. Come on, let's get ready to go home. Y'all want to get it in? I'm going to make sure you know you may want to do something. Thank you, Mr. Adams and sisters. We didn't get there neither. I'm a pastor church, I didn't get there. I listen, I'm mad too. Yeah, I'm the pastor, I didn't get no fish. I didn't get no cornbread. <laughs> Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face up on you, give you peace. The Lord bless you going out and you coming in his fourth night for evermore. The Lord bless you, your children, and your children's children. Yeah. The Lord bless every aspect of your life. Now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the speaking communion of the Holy Spirit. Rest with about this his fourth night forever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.